I welcome everyone today. It very wet day, on Friday. <laughs> but yeah, I would like to remind everyone it's it been recorded and been uploaded to YouTube. We had a party we see from San uh, Cancer Doyle, Wormden, and Cancer Bang. Is there any more parties? Okay. But minutes are for period meeting. I hear for approval. Is there any moot for? Okay, second there. And the wall turn now. Cool. Can we have a vote? <laughs> ah, fine. Been approved. Any debt right not interest? No. Okay. So we go on with the topic and update from the external audit. By uh, Bethany Hintz. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly because I don't think I've met many people on the committee, but I'm Bethany Hinks, representative from Assets External Auditors. Um, I am the engagement manager on the audit for this year. Um, so I'll just provide a verbal update on the 23-24 audit. The audit has progressed well and continues to progress well. Um, we've had very high levels of engagement from the finance team and wider management, which has been really, really positive, especially with it being our first year of being auditors for the council. Um, we've received extremely quick responses to all of our queries and questions. Most cases, we don't need to wait any longer than a day, which has been really fantastic from um, a progression point of view. Um, as I in our audit plan, we had... Um, aimed to finish the audit by the end of September as an aspirational date that we were working towards. We are on track to complete our audit work over the next week, notwithstanding final reviews from myself and the audit partner, Laura. At this stage, we don't have any significant audit findings to bring to your attention or any material adjustments to the financial statements. Um, we will be bringing our audit findings report and our auditor's annual uh, report to the next committee in November ahead of the national deadline which is set at the 28th of February 2025. Our work um, in relation to our significant risk areas is largely complete. Um, one area to bring to your attention is that we are still awaiting um, the assurances that we require from the pension fund auditor. We have been in communication with them which has been really positive. Um, they haven't been able to give us a set date yet for when they expect to respond to us by, um, but we are hopeful this will be um, weeks as opposed to months, but we are in um, communication with them about that regularly. Um, with regards to value for money, uh, we've held all of the meetings that we have needed to for BFM. The write-up for this is currently um, ongoing at the moment. Subject to final review, we don't have any areas of significant weakness that we uh, anticipate reporting to you, which is positive. <coughs> Other areas that are um, ongoing at the moment are um, the pooling of housing capital receipts. We've received all of the information with regards to that and we anticipate that being completed by the end of next week. We have also completed our work on the housing benefit assurance process for 23-24 as well um, and that claim form required no amendments before submitting to the DWP, which is positive. I'm happy to take any questions. Right, no more got any questions? Andy? Um, thank you very much. Um, can I start by looking at page 20, which is Appendix 1, please? I'm just trying to understand some of this information. I wonder if you could help me with, with, with that. My reading of this was that was an audit plan for the year. Is, 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 is that right? Am I looking at the wrong thing? Yeah, yes. Oh, well, shut up then. We're coming to that one, yeah. Right. No worries. <laughs> uh, anyone out got any questions?
Yeah, we would like to thank you for that. And we will move on to the next one, the internal audit progress report. And I believe your questions probably oh, come yeah. up on that one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but let uh, move on. Let um, and you would go through the okay, report fine. first. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to present my report to the Committee on the Work completed by Internal Audit during the first quarter of 24-25. I ask that the Committee notes the contents of my report. Detailed work progress is included within Appendix 1 of my report, and this outlines that we've completed 12% of the audit plan, compared against a profile performance indicator of 25%. However, I would like to highlight that during the, the quarter, we fully closed three audits which had rolled over from 2023-24, and I can also verbally confirm that the last remaining audit from the previous financial year was closed out in early quarter two and will be reported to this committee at its next meeting. Quarter one work was also affected by a management request in which we undertook unplanned work with a review of cash income and collection processes at the assembly rooms. Our agreed KPI for completion of the audit plan is 90% by the 31st of March 2024 and I anticipate that this will be met. We continue to use eTech business services to provide IT audit coverage, and this audit area is on schedule and working to the planned IT audits identified following an audit needs assessment completed in March 2024. We also use BDO as a general auditor resource to support delivery of the audit plan, and they are in the process of scoping and briefing <coughs> audits with management. The reintroduction of this resource will aid completion of the plan by the end of the financial year. I've also provided an analysis of the currently outstanding audit recommendations, and this is represented graphically in my report. I can confirm that whilst there has been a downward trend for the number of outstanding audit recommendations, from 130 at the end of quarter one in 2021-22 to 57 as at the 30th of June 2024. There is, however, a general increase between the end of 2023 and 2024 and the current quarter. The overall trend for high priority recommendations continues to be on a downward curve. However, this has been countered by an increase in the medium and low priority recommendation numbers. This increase in overall numbers is due to a number of new recommendations which have been entered onto the system following the conclusion of the audits during quarter one of this financial year. Following discussions with the Chair of the Committee, I propose that at the next Audit and Governance Committee meeting in, Mar in November, not March, sorry, I apologise, I bring forward a separate and detailed report outlining all outstanding audit recommendations. This will provide the Committee with further detail around the specific audit recommendations made, the priority and also the management explanations regarding the timescales for completion. This will provide the committee an opportunity to review those recommendations and potentially request management attendance at the committee to explain the reasons for the delayed implementation of audit recommendations. I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Yes, uh, it's, you've done some good work again. Uh, well done. Um, one question that uh, uh, has, has sprung to light with this is, You've got the trends going up and down in various, and that highlights or uh, the alarm bells to me is, do you have enough resources to actually not just achieve them now, but future-proof it? That is something that we continue to keep under, on, under review effectively. Obviously, uh, in relation to the current resources, as the committee will be aware, it is a shared service arrangement between ourselves and Litchfield, and I can draw down resource from Litchfield and the pr principal order, and she's done principal auditor, and she's done extensive work at Tamworth in quarter quarter one, for example, in relation to the assembly rooms review. So I can pull that information down, that uh, resource down, and also we can also pull further resource down from BDO as well. We're not just limited on a set number of audits. We have planned out that work, but if we need them to do additional work, then we can we can obviously pull pull them in, um, so that they can effectively have a have a look at that. Obviously, we we also we keep the sort of resourcing generally um, 
under review at the moment, for example, at Tamworth, um, as myself as the audit manager, I've got myself and the counter fraud officer, basically. So we don't have any, any, any specific auditors on establishment within Tamworth. Um, but we do have that facility to potentially recruit also additional auditors from Litchfield because at the moment those are still on the, effectively on the establishment at Litchfield. The difficulty that we've had, and I think I've, I've sort of, re, I've, I've spoken about this I think previously at, at other audit and governance committees, is the the difficulty in make in recruiting at the moment certainly within the audit profession and I would I would, I would probably say both internal audit and external audit as well um, and again we are looking at that in relation to potentially looking down the apprentice route um, but again in discussions with all the other audit managers within Staffordshire the issues that we potentially have is then retaining that member of staff because as soon as they get qualified then they potentially move on um, and I think that's the difficulty that we have and I think at other um, I don't necessarily want to speak for other authorities but I think generally I think that has been an issue in the past um, that they can't retain those qualified auditors the other side, and again, it is, is the other area, is when you do obviously recruit, if, you, if you're recruiting somebody who's brand new into internal audit, there's then a lead time between them actually coming in, training them, and then letting them run with, with audits by themselves, effectively, without the mentoring from myself as the audit manager. But I hope that would provide some assurance in, to the committee in relation, relation to that. Uh, Paul Turner, any more? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks, you, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. It is not just on the private sector, but the public sector. Auditing is, is a scarce resource, uh, and you know the the, the highest uh, remuneration packages are, are tending to uh, draw the right people in the right places. So it's a bit of you know supply and demand, isn't it? Um, bearing that in mind and looking to the future, uh, and obviously you know we're trying to juggle the balls that uh, we haven't got anybody permanently. Um, has that been addressed in a budget plan to go forward to say if we need to up the salaries and the financial and non-financial benefits to attract the right people and retain them and train them uh, are we uh, as a committee um, aware of what them true costs should be and could be in the market uh, and what we need to do to address that thanks I think I would actually need to take that away and have a, have a have a discussion with with finance in relation to to that. Obviously, there is just the at the moment there is just the budget in place for effectively the audit manager and the counter fraud officer in relation to that, and obviously that's then based on our on on our salaries and, and on costs effectively in, in relation to that. Um, again, we do we do have budget there for delivery of the service in relation to using external providers. So we have got budget there in there. Um, and obviously then we would be in a position that we'd, if we needed further resourcing in relation, then we'd obviously have to make a suitable business case in relation to that, to actually then draw, draw that down. But at the moment, effectively, how I'm currently working with the audit, with the audit plan, we are fully budgeted for that resource. Obviously, if we did need to look at other other elements in relation to drawing down, for example, maybe the principal auditor doing further work at Tamworth, then she obviously does attract a cost to Tamworth in relation to that. But again, we would then manage the budgets in relation to that because we could then also look at, depending on, for example, using external resource as in BDO, BDO would be actually more expensive than using the principal auditor, so we can save some costs in that in that area as well. So again, we can work around with the budgets, um, and it's something that we do keep keep an eye on in relation to that. And then, if we do need to need any more time or need more resource, then obviously I can make the suitable case to finance in relation to getting that getting that approved. about you know apprenticeships you're saying that they go is there any way you can do like a golden handshake so if you've got an apprentice that you like
that or when you sign them up as an apprentice, you say, right, we train you up, but then you've got to give us, say, three years. Golden handcuffs. Yeah, golden yeah, handcuffs, yeah. yeah. I'm not too sure. I'd have to take that away and have a look at, a look at that because, again, that, that, is an, that is an element that we'd, we'd actually have to do further work on in relation to that. Um, but at, at the moment, as I say, I'm not aware of any of those, shall we say, golden handcuffs, shall we say, right, in, in relation to that currently operating uh, within, within local government, as far as I'm aware. Um, one quick one before I go to you. To, you did do a good question for a while. Uh, we'd like to add, what about skill set and knowledge set, spec-wise areas? Have we got any resources on that area, like ITC? In, um, in relation to, for example, IT audit, and from that side of things, we do use eTech Business Services, who are... So who who is a specific IT auditor? So they've got the full full knowledge in relation to yeah. IT audit, and the other side from the the contract that we've got with with ETech Business Services, we can also draw down resource from them to provide advice around technical operations within ICT generally, because obviously that's something as an internal audit section we don't hold um, specifically. Um, so we do have that that sort of knowledge and skill set, uh, or available knowledge and skill set. I think the the other side is that the myself, for example, in relation to being an audit manager, I am a fully trained and, and chartered member of the Institute of Internal Audit. So I, I've got um, I say 32 years experience within within sort of internal audit both in the public and the private sector but again we have got further both the principal auditor for example has got 15 to 20 years experience in internal audit so from a control environment and also a strategic risk environment we've got quite a lot of knowledge that we can that we can draw on um, again as part of that um, sort of that skill set basically that's what we're looking for for from, from an auditor in relation to not only working maybe in the public or private sector, but also having that, that, con that systems of control knowledge and risk management knowledge and strategic risk knowledge so that they can bring that into the, into the authority. Um, and again, it is, it is quite a dynamic skill set that changes over time as well. Um, because again what we find is that not only do we have the sort of the counter fraud work but again what we find is that the elements within internal audit that changes over time and again I specifically I can I can remember effectively we were we were looking at systems of internal control so we would we would actually document those as part of our review now we're looking as internal audit at looking at strategic risks and the objectives for the council to ensure that the council meets its objectives to the to the citizens of the of, of the council area so again it is a continual continual moving feast effectively um, but again the other thing that we do do as part of the part of the section and it's part of our external quality assessment as well to maintain the public sector internal audit standards is to obviously maintain our, our continuing professional development so that, again, we've got budget in there to actually continue that on and, and make sure that we do develop going going forward. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. I was thinking up more like uh, when we're training new people up yeah. and making sure we've got a seal requirement. I will pass it to Paul. Thanks. I don't want to take, take any, but this is the final bit, really. It, it's quite ironic, really, that we're at... Um, you know, audit and governance, and now we're discussing about uh, the audit manager and the role of future proofing it in within within this organisation. You know, this business model, really, this organisation. And one thing that I see as a uh, a challenge is because of the shortage of auditors, both public and private. Training is a massive issue. Setting the right remuneration packages is also a challenge because we've never had to do it and we've all re relied on external resources. And, and that's a great short-term fix. I really do think that. But I am 
looking at this and you've done some you know since i was chair you've done some amazing work david in you know the time that andrew the time that you've been here um and i'm wondering now we are where we are and it's quite in good order this the rules are changing what you've just said you know internal external pressures and targets and, and objectives are changing how are we are we building the right resilience in the audit and governance teams to accommodate that and make sure that we are fit for purpose going forward? I feel at the moment that, that we are. I think, I think the general resilience within, within the team is, is there. And I think also the knowledge is, is there. I think sort of from a, from a resilience process sort of moving forward, it is developing that and looking to potentially fulfill that resource and have it in house as in, even, even if it's effectively Litchfield, effectively in relation to that, that you've got that in house resource there. Because again, there, there still is that little, that little bit, there is a lead time in relation to drawing drawing that external resource down into the into the section whereas if you've already got people as at almost at the end of the phone or just down at the bottom of the road e effectively at Litchfield you can draw that draw them down fairly quickly in relation to that um, again I think it, it's one of those areas that we do keep under as I've said before we do keep under review um, we've got we at Litchfield for example we've been out three times since I've been since I've been here since June 2021 uh, and we haven't had any suitable candidates that have actually applied so that that does reflect in, in relation to that again we would we would get a training package together if it was somebody coming in brand new into internal audit we would we would have a training package on there again one of the areas that we have tried to do is look at an already developed auditor or an internal auditor who's already trained and, and qualified and pitch that I believe at the, the right level at the market rate for current Staffordshire authorities. Again we, I think to a certain extent and I, I always sort of I know a little bit of a shrug of shoulders when I sort of say this around I think we've also been caught in the perfect storm I know we're now post pandemic pandemic yeah. um, but again I think a lot of people have been or a lot of auditors have been reviewing what they do, what they do where, where they go how they're working whether it's a hybrid approach or whether it's an office approach um, and again there are there are extensive anecdotal evidence in relation to people applying and there may be a hundred to a hundred 250 miles away because they can work remotely effectively from that again I think that's something that we as as an audit section an audit manager that's we need to keep that under review and and as market conditions change then obviously be on the on the upward curve in, in relation to being proactive in in that area to to attract somebody to Tamworth and Litchfield for the for the for the shared service of arrangement. Do you want to go back on it? No. Okay, I know you've been waiting for ages. Yeah. <laughs> um, th thanks very much. Um, in, in view of what Paul was talking about there, I, I, and I did have a quick look down to item eight. Um, I just wondered if there was a general item or even a more specific item that, that, that ought to be included on the risk register about uh, uh, staffing. I, you don't have to answer that one straight away, but I, I just genuinely think that, 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 that things like auditing is really, really important to understand where you are and, and if you can't fulfil that function. And I'm sure there are other functions within, within the council who have the same sort of story. We should be recognising that on... The, the risk management, because in my world, risk management should should uh, come up with a mitigation strategy and a plan and be under constant review. So it's, it's, in, it's in your face, etc. Yeah, It's a reminder to do it. It's a reminder to do it. And uh, I just feel from my brief association with the council that there are a number of elements of the service which are struggling in under a similar, a similar, a similar um, potential risk. I think we will come back to that when we get to it. 
That's but fine. I've got some lesson. questions on this table, if I'm cool. right, and, and mainly this Carry is on. about clarifications. And um, for, again, it's about educating me. Um, table 20. Now, I've appreciated the difference between the external audit and your internal audit. So apologies, Andrew. Uh, and um, I looked through the table, which I found very interesting because it's, it's, it helps me. But this is essentially the, the plan of the auditing for, for, for that financial year of 23-24. So I guess my first question is that, that I would have expected all of the Q1 audits to have been completed by now or, or have something in, 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 in progress against them. The, the actual table from page 20 on, onwards is for 24-25 financial year. So, so and it is, it is, um, it is an indic the quarters are indic they're indicative, in other words, in relation to the plan of, of where we were looking to, to actually do those, do those audits. What we, what we do do though, is that we do, we do move those audits around within the, within the planned work. That can be due to both availability of audit staff with the relevant, with, with the relevant experience, but also the availability of both management and also operational staff in those areas as well. So we work with managers in, in relation to that. Again, I think in relation to quarter one, and, and this is one of the areas that we are, as I indicated in the report, behind the curve in relation to the risk, pro, to the actual profile of completion in, in relation to that is, Again, one of the things that we, we, we did do during quarter one was close out those audits from, the pre, from quarter four in 23-24. Um, now again, a lot of those were at draft report stage and it was a lot of, it was, it was basically management time in relation to finalizing those audits. The actual field work had actually been completed it was just a matter of, of actually getting the draft report and the final report over the line with management management responses. But again, over time and next quarter, for example, when I report at the next committee in November, then that table will be filled further with, with the actual results of the work that we've actually completed, both quarter one and quarter two. Um, but again, the, qu the quarters themselves in the table, like I say, it's an indicative plan, but it isn't a, it isn't a set in stone plan. We, what we try and do is, is sort of roll, roll that with, with management in relation to that. So we might find that we'll move a quarter two audit into quarter one and vice versa, we'll do a similar sort of thing with, with the other quarters. So the, the, uh, again, I notice in there you, you've got uh, for example, um, CR1, CR6, what, what are those referring to, please? Those, those are referring to the corporate, the council's corporate risks. So ah. effectively, what we do as an as in, internal audit section is that we are a risk-based internal audit section. So what we do is we base the plan around the council's corporate risks. So effectively, that's the, that's the reference through. So again, what you then can see is a clear line between the audits that we do and also the corporate risks that we are looking to actually confirm the mitigations and making sure that the controls and the assurances are in place in those areas. Um, again, it's one of those areas that we, we do sort of keep on, under, under review. And again, one of the areas that, or, or some of the areas, for example, we don't necessarily review council tax each and every year, but we would have a look at other income streams within the authority to actually then provide that corporate, that coverage of the corporate risk around income, etc. Again, it's part of those, those areas that we've developed over time because one of the areas that we do find is that from, a, from looking at a systems of control environment, council tax will be quite high up because of the number of transactions and the value. But again, what we were finding was that we were reviewing those year in, year out, and there was substantial assurance each and every year. So what we, what we with moving to this risk-based approach, what we now do is look at other areas so that 
we're not we still look at uh, council tax and we still look at non-domestic rates but we might we'll look at those once every couple of years or once every three years again it's focusing those resources into the into the what i believe within the audit plan are the right areas and the, and the risk areas for the authority so thanks for that the my, my other observation is that, that uh, again i'm forgive me because I'm still trying to get to terms with all this, that, that there seems to be a wide variety of themes that you are auditing against. Some of them appear to be very strategic, some of them appear to be very financial, but there are other things in there such as what caught my eye was food safety, for example. Uh, I'm guessing, uh, what I'm getting to is what are we auditing against? I'm, I'm guessing what underpins all of these audits is a, a, a policy or a set of procedures or something which the council have put in place that, that's saying this is the way we're doing things, i.e. this is the governance arrangement that we feel is adequate, and that is what you're auditing against. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that, that, is inc that, that is correct, In I would suggest, in part, in mm. relation to that. An area, for example, around food safety, for mm. example, we would look at the key risks within food safety. One of, the, one of the first risks in food safety is you don't actually undertake any food safety inspections for example mm. so part of that risk and looking at the mitigations is to ensure that those inspections are being undertaken and they're being undertaken in a timely manner and they're undertaken in a professional manner we did previously when we were looking at and when we were sort of looking at sort of systems of control we did have internal control questionnaires which basically you could actually pick that up from SITFA in relation to food safety and it would give you a lot of risks and it would give you a lot of controls and a lot of processes and we would actually use that to actually do the to do the audit that was a number of number of years ago with moving over to risk-based audit what we now do is as part of the internal audit process we we speak to the managers we actually identify with the managers what their main risks are and then ask them how, how are they mitigating those risks going forward. And again, it goes back to both service delivery and also as food safety, food safety, food hygiene, et cetera, on, on that side of things. So again, we, there, there isn't necessarily a tick check list that we operate now we now work in conjunction with management, but also with our own knowledge of those risks and also the strategic risk and corporate risks of the authority and then link them to get them basically link them together. So that then that would effectively then provide that we are giving that overview and assurance in relation to that. Because again, the internal control questionnaires didn't necessarily look at, shall we say, the the service objectives and basically that delivery to the general public or the okay. residents of Tamworth, for example. So, so that's where we are now. I hope okay. that gives a no. No, that's overview. given me a much clearer understanding of how that works. Uh, thank, thanks very much for that. There's just two. I've just got two further observations, and and one of them is pretty petty. And forgive me, but it's just the way I am. But one of them is page twenty-seven. Um, you talk about an audit there of business continuity, and I, I read there's a, quite a lot of um, narrative there, um, and, and just my cold reading of that um, concerned me a little bit because it suggested that it was perhaps to me anyway it suggested that the the traffic light system perhaps was on the should be towards more the red than the amber, but that's just my cold reading of that because anything involving our failure to deliver things concerns me as a council. In relation to the traffic light system, if it was red, then we wouldn't be providing any assurance at all. It would be a no assurance review, right. effectively, on that. What we've done is, is deem that as limited, limited assurance, which is obviously the next, next, the next assurance. Right. As a sort of, I suppose if you're going from no assurance to substantial assurance in that going down, then limited is the next one down. Um, we have got that traffic light system and obviously the traffic light system we've actually got four assurance levels and there's only three effectively there's only three traffic lights effectively as red amber or green in relation to that i think in relation to that that 
that was an area that we did we did have a look at and we did have concerns around mm -hmm. in relation to the fact that the, those business continuity plans weren't regularly reviewed when we actually when we had when our IT auditor haven't had a look at them and actually we we had got issues in relation to that and that that then relates to the high priority recommendation that was was made I think also as part of this and I think in discussions with with the chair of the committee um, as I sort of iterated before in relation to the outstanding audit recommendations is that it would be more helpful if I could bring those high priority recommendations uh, and also the other recommendations to the committee so that you can actually review them and see them because at the moment you can't actually sit from the way that the report is is done and structured you can't actually see what the high priority recommendation was mm. and also what the management actions are being put in place to actually address those mm. So again, I think that's something that we we, we can have a look at. Um, what we do, and again, it is quite a it, it is quite a long. Um, I was going to say verbiage in relation to the the yeah. actual yeah. in the report. Yeah. Yeah. What we do as part of the report is that is actually basically copy and pasted from the rationale from the internal audit report itself so that it, it, it we don't go in or myself as an audit manager i don't actually go in and actually change that and update it because i feel that it's more appropriate that you as the audit committee have that rationale in its uncut sent, version sent to yeah as it's been sent to management okay thank you okay. Uh, my one petty one which i said i, I promised I'd, I'd put it on page 30 you've, you've got the number of outstanding recommendations by priority. What threw me on on that graph, which is useful, um, was the colours. Um, I was expecting a, a, a mirroring of the traffic light system, so I've got, I've got a sort of a, 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 a movie colour in there. Um, and also, when I look at the key, I see two, two low risks. I know one of them isn't. Um, I know it's only a minor thing, but for uh, times gone, in, in times into the future, it might, get, might be misconstrued, that's all. Should, should that not be... Should there not be an amber on the thing? Was that is that on purpose? No, because the, this is just specifically looking at the audit recommendations themselves, and we've only got three priority of audit recommendations. So it's high, medium, or low. It basically that doesn't reflect the assurance levels for audits. These are just the num the total number of, of recommendations. I think the we did try to, I suppose the. Again, looking looking at it and quickly looking at the the actual graph, for example, um, on page thirty, I noticed that we've got low recommendations twice, for example, in the in the legend. Um, now, effectively, what what we did was 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 actually have a look at uh, look at that, and basically the, the high priority recommendations we would we would be colouring red, but I can have a we can have a look at look at this and and. Make it make it more obvious in relation to that. that. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's great. Everyone being critical on the audits, to be honest, at what we need. So next thing we're going to move to the debate. Yeah, if there is any debate to be had. Then we'll... Anyone want to debate it? Okay, thank you. I don't think so. Yeah. We've asked the questions. Okay, cool. So, uh, for wet Monday, I need to, to note it down. So, any any movers? Move Seconders? Okay, cool. We need a vote. We need a vote. vote. Oh, wait, we haven't got all members left. We have, we've got the chair. We've got the chair yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very lucky. But I do like everyone being critical. I think that's very important. Oh, sorry, Councillor Carrington. Do you want me to? We've got some more.
Don't just pull council account. Yeah. Um, we always vote it on the recommendation for to note it down. Are you? We vote it to wet, uh, note it down. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh good. <laughs> so we are moving now to a reviewing of the annual report of tra uh, uh, treasure management services and at upper Ditton indicators. I know it already been through corporate scrutiny, I believe. Um, I don't think it's been. Has it been through corporate? Well, cabinet. Cabinet. Yeah, okay. Council, yeah. I thought something like it. Um, so I hand over to. Thank you. Um, so this is the um, annual outturn report for Treasury Management Service and the actual prudential indicators for 23-24. So the Treasury Management Code of Practice requires that the Council nominate an appropriate committee to scrutinise its Treasury Management activities. And at its meeting on the 23rd of February 2010, Council approved that this committee scrutinise the strategy and policies as well as receiving regular monitoring reports. With regard to ensuring effective scrutiny of the Treasury management strategy and policies, the report outlines the Code's suggestions, which are that this involves reviewing the Treasury management policy and procedures and making recommendations to the responsible body. It sets out that public service organisations have a responsibility to ensure that those charged with governance have access to the skills and knowledge they require to carry out this role effectively. Those charged with governance also have a personal responsibility to ensure they have the appropriate skills and training for their role. The procedures for monitoring Treasury management activities through audit, scrutiny and inspection should be sound and rigorously applied with an openness of access to information and well-defined arrangements for the review and implementation of recommendations for change and that this includes the provision of monitoring information and regular review by councillors in both executive and scrutiny functions. So in compliance with the above, a copy of the annual report on the Treasury Management Service and actual prudential indicators for 23-24, as approved by council on the 10th of September 2024, is attached at Annex 1. And members are asked if they have any suggested recommend recommendations or amendments for Cabinet. Thank you. Anyone got any suggestions or questions? I do have a question. Go ahead. Then. I don't know whether you can answer this. Because um, looking at it, apparently last year we had a £2 million underspend. And I just wondered in which areas it came from. Are you picking that up from the, from the report somewhere? The two no, minutes? it was from what Councillor Jay said at the last um, council meeting. He said that we'd had um, a £2 million underspend uh, last year, and I just wondered where it'd come from. He might be referring to the general fund underspend mm -hmm. we had last year. Um, in a large part, that was to do with our Treasury Management Investment Income, and you'll see in this report we've generated last year a significant um, surplus on our investment income. I saw that, yeah. Um, so we, we had been budgeting um, 1.3 million. We actually received 3.4 million in mm -hmm. investment income, and that was as a result of increased interest rates and also additional balances that we had to invest. Right, so we didn't actually not spend the money that we'd actually allocated into 2023 from the budget so that a, lar a large part of that was additional income rather than yeah, underspend that, budgets. That's what I Some to of it would have been because there's underspends, overspends in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, one of the big drivers of that was the additional income. Right, thank you. You okay. can tell I'm not an accountant. Okay, have you got any um, other questions? Andy? Unfortunately, I've got a few questions, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've struggled a little bit. I wonder if you just help me a little bit on page 36 um, with the prudential and treasury indicators there. Um, generally, 
when I look at the first set of figures, it talks about the capital expenditure, and, and it's against obviously the, uh, the, the non-HRA, which I'm assuming is the general fund or covers under the general, it's another way of saying the general fund, and the HRA, which is the housing revenue account, which is obviously his ring fenced account for, for to do with council housings. So when it talks about capital expenditure, that's effectively what we spent or what, what we would, would have spent in that year. Is that, is that correct? Is that what that means, that first bit? So capital expenditure is any expenditure that creates or enhances an asset. Um, so your HRA um, capital expenditure will be around um, repairs to council houses in a large part. Also, um, we've got various other schemes such as regeneration schemes, and retention of garage sites and so on. Um, and non-HRA capital expenditure, we've got schemes in the capital program, for example, regeneration schemes, future high street fund schemes, um, and other capital programs around IT and no, so on. So that's I, I, th I think I get that now, Joe. I, it's the bird capital that got me, uh, I understand that. So if it's not actually spent on capital, it's not there. If it's, for example, if you were paying uh, for a service where it's not, it's not a capital that would So paying for a service would largely be revenue costs, that's your revenue running costs. Right, okay. Yeah. I think so I've that doesn't put, form part of It doesn't of form this. part of that. So then the next bit talks about the capital financing requirement. So that suggests to me that's money that we need to be able to, to, to be able to, to, to spend that money, is it? Well, the, the capital financing requirement is like a measure of that, how much money we owe. So. The HRA, for example, we've got £63 million worth of debt from the PWLB. So that capital financing requirement is a measure of our indebtedness overall. And also, if in our capital programme we have any schemes that we need to finance through borrowing, that's what the capital finance requirement indicator shows. OK. So, again, sorry, the, the picture I was picking up, maybe I've misunderstood this because I've been through other tables as well is that, that there are debts uh, not unnaturally um, yeah, in fact it says they're 63, 63 million pounds of debt is that right and then we've got yes. the investments which overshadow that thankfully to the right side of 66 million so we're actually carrying debts and we've got investments at the same time and I think as you've explained to me in, 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 in previous uh, previous meetings that, that uh, it, it and in fact, you confirmed not too long ago, it worked out quite well in terms of the investments and the increase in, in, in general base rate. So we, we, we gained some money on that. One thing that struck me was that if we've still got debts, which is, you know, are, are we not going to get, a, get, get charged additionally for those debts? And should we not be looking strategically to perhaps uh, rebalance the books a bit? I don't know. Um, just. So most, as we said, uh, most of our, well, pretty all of our debt is HRA debt. It's long-term borrowing with the Public Works Loan Board. So most of that isn't repayable for a good few years down the line. If we did pay it off early, we would um, get charged a redemption penalty. It's, it's, it's fixed. Uh, uh, yes, it, it is. is. It's not a question that bank suddenly goes, ah, we're going to charge No, no, it's all fixed. Actually, no, we can't. <laughs> there are other rules on that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I've got a question. Um, it's a bit more clear for uh, project nights. How much of the uh, investment in liquid funds compared to non liquid funds? Um, we normally keep roughly, it does fluctuate in terms of our cash flow, we tend to have around between 5 and 10 million in liquid funds which is money that we can call off um, same day if we need to. Um, so we, we keep some of it in a funds where we can call back to manage our cash flow, for example to pay salaries and wages or creditors so we've got that that we can call off um, quickly. 
but then most of our um, investments then the lo are longer term ones usually for six months or so with other um, we've got a lot of investments with other local authorities because they offer good rates and they're very um, secure okay so what like long terms we got on investments maturity rates in the non liquid funds um, I think it's about 50 million ish, 55 million off the top of my head at the minute. I'm just thinking like long term, like term to maturity, like how many years or months? Uh, typically six months. So in our strategy, we can lend for a maximum of one year usually. Okay, that's very clear. What about the property investments? Are they? Yeah, so our property fund investments, we've got um, about £12 million with those split, split across three different funds. They're all long term. Um, so then they are not quite classed quite the same as our other treasury investments, which are to do with managing cash flows. The property funds are specific longer term investments that we've held for. We do get a, an income stream from them, but they help for capital growth primarily. Okay, good to know. Uh, what do, I don't want it to make it clear to everyone, especially a booklet, on how it all works. So I know it, we have it all non-liquid funds who can get in real trouble. Um, one question is, is there any internal debt limits we can have? For limit on borrowing for non uh, HMR internally? Not for non capital expenses? Um, sorry, can you just. Say okay, that? so is non capital expenses, is there any set limits on oh, internally? For, for revenue yeah. spend, we, we wouldn't want to be borrowing for um, revenue expenditure. We can, we can only borrow for a capital purpose, and even then, within certain strict criteria, um, you know, there's, it's got to be prudential and sustainable and affordable. Yeah, good to know. Anyone have Okay. I'm very happy it came and hopefully you get some more reports on this. So anyone want to go to debates? Okay, so for Wetman dates and eats. But remember consider the annual report and the your management up thing. Detail at payment one and highlight it any post trains for um, recommendation to cabinets. Any movers? Yeah. Seconders? Vote? Okay, cool. So now we're going to financial waivers and back to you. Thank you. Um, so this um, is the report on financial waivers um, granted for the first quarter of the financial year to the 30th of June 2024. So as part of the core functions under its term of reference, this committee is empowered to maintain an overview of the Council's financial guidance. One of the improvement recommendations included within Grant Thornton's Auditor's Annual Report for 22-23 was that the council should report on the number and value of waivers to, to the Audit and Governance Committee on a quarterly basis. So this is the first such report. The waivers approved during the first quarter are set out in Appendix 1. And it is requested that committee notes the waivers approved to the procurement processes as set out in the council's financial guidance. I'm happy to take any further <coughs> questions. Okay, then anyone want to debate it? There are no questions? No? 
So, yeah. I think it makes sense, actually, with the, as long as we know, for instance, the castle work that needed to be done, there are only a very few in the country um, companies that deal with it. And if you're going to have this Midland conservation where you've got the scaffolding already up, then to put it out to tender and get some, it's just going to cost us extra money. So I can understand where that waiver is. I think what we've just got to be careful is that it's not done on an ad hoc basis all the time. Um, you know, that, for instance, general work isn't done as a waiver, but it's, it's specialist work um, and where it's going to save us money. So, I, you know, I, I understand that and I think it's a good, good point, good policy. I think that's a fair note. So for Wetman Dyson is to but the council will note that we waive approval to the Huntington post that that's set out in the council for now or guidance. Any motion grant you any secondary copy secondary <laughs> vote. Okay, that pats. Councillor Turner was voting on that as well. Councillor Turner? Yeah. What are you voting on it? Sorry? What are you voting on approval for yeah, it? On that? Yeah. Okay, no <laughs> problem. So, so I think the net one bit more interesting, and I would recommend being critical on it one, is the Whit Management Quarter update. And um, back to good fellas. Thank you. Um, so this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter one of the 24-25 financial year. One of the functions of the Audit and Governance Committee is to monitor the effectiveness of the authority's strategic risk management arrangements. This report includes the actions taken to manage those risks and raises issues of concern that may impact the authority. Corporate risks are identified, managed and monitored by the corporate management team on a quarterly basis. The Corporate Risk Register has been reviewed and current risk scores and notes have been updated by CMT for quarter one reporting and a copy of the current Corporate Risk Register is attached at Appendix 1. This report does not refer to the incidents at the Holiday Inn as this took place during quarter two and will be reflected in the next Corporate Risk Report. The 24-25 Corporate Risk Profile can be seen in Appendix 2. A key to the likelihood and impact matrix scoring has been included to provide some context and additional notes have been added to the risk register. The report includes an update on progress against internal audits risk management recommendations and at Appendix 3, a copy of the training presentation to members by Zurich Municipal in August can be found. The committee is asked to endorse the corporate risk register. Thank you. I would say that I, having a week notes are great. It's a massive improvement to understand and for them to explain what's going on. So, uh, anyone got any questions on this? And it, yeah, I think, I think um, obviously, um, financial stability has come out yet again at, for, as 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 an alert status, um, and forgive me, I should have done my homework before I came here. I'm just trying to read the latest note on that because I think it's useful that as a committee we understand what the latest action is on that, um, as it's as it's as it's as it's right up there. Uh, but I think I'm just reading as it comes. Uh, we, we we did put forward um, the productivity plan that was submitted. I'm not sure where any of that's got or what the impact is to, to, the, to the council at this point in time. Um, if I could be incredibly lazy, could, um, could you appraise me of where we are with this latest risk? Thank you. So in terms of the productivity plan that was submitted to um, government, obviously that was before the general election. Um, we've had no indication as yet as to what the new administration will be doing with any of those. Um, so we're still awaiting any further feedback on that. 
Um, notwithstanding that, we have commenced our budget process for um, 25-26 and looking at our future MTFS. And as part of that, we are considering our um, financial stability plan and looking at some actions to um, uh, achieve savings where we can and look for opportunities for uh, additional income. So that work has just commenced and um, you will no doubt have had various um, meeting invites to workshops and things. So that's all, that's all currently kicking off. Thank you. I've got a couple of problems. I'm, I'm glad you sort of like preempted and said it's before August, this thing, because I think that some of these will come back a lot different the next meeting. The one thing I'm slightly concerned about as well is um, on page 61 is governance, and it's got a green light um, because it was highlighted at uh, the ISAG scrutiny committee that. The previous administration, somebody had, well, the, the leader and the chief executive signed off £60,000 worth of reserves to finance something. I'm not, I'm not being political here because I'm not, I'm not make, trying to make political points, but it was the fact that it hadn't been signed off by a Section 51 officer or it hadn't been to Cabinet or it hadn't been to Council. And when you get slippages, like, you know, that's not good governance, is it? So I'm j looking forward to when we get the new um, schedule of delegation that we, they, I think it's coming later in the year at Council, if I'm right. Do we get, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. And we can debate it then. But it's just that um, I'm a bit concerned it got a green light when I would have thought it would, at that stage, it would be an orange, a, a yellow light, but not orange, because it's not. Amber? Thing. Amber, that's it's what I meant. Um, and then I think, obviously, the ones that are coming up, when we look at this, we'll be looking at different colours probably um, next quarter. Thank you, Chair. Any, any questions? We're talking questions, sorry. Oh, yeah, and um, we might have no politics kind of no, things. No politics, this is purely administration Okay. So, any questions? Any others? Paul? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, one thing that's just uh, popped up is um, it says that there's an ongoing cost of the li cost of living crisis and inflationary pressures are having an impact on the council's income from households struggling to pay their council tax uh, and housing rent payments, etc. Um, this has been raised to a red in in our risk matrix. Um, if it is a red, what plans and actions? are in place to quickly address that and what data have you got to say there is more non-payment than there has been to, to ele elevate it into a high risk area? Um, I don't have all that information with me at the moment but it is something that we do monitor and report on as part of the quarterly performance health check and um, there's a a whole section in there with regard to um, community well-being and we report there on collection rates and universal credit claimants and housing benefit claimants and the impact of cost of living there and um, so far our collection rates have held up quite well and mm -hmm. um, you know they, they are historically very good and they're continuing to to be high in the circumstances but it is something that, that is a risk factor, so we continue to flag it as part of this uh, risk register. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, I mean, all I would say coming back on that is that, uh, yes, that's great to hear the generalisation that we're, we are aware of it and whatever. Um, can I ask that on the next meeting that there's some numbers and data to back that up to see if there is any trend analysis that we should be worried about over, say, I don't know, the last three years? Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll like people putting comment and questions. Right. It brilliant. It's just that our revenues um, collection for council uh, tax is in the 90%. It, it's very, very efficient. And I wondered whether, do the revenues department speak to the housing department collecting the rents 
to see whether or not I know I know we have issues with universal credit people transferring over and and that can lead to delays and, and I think it's up to eight weeks for some people when they transfer over but I'm just wondering whether or not we could look at how revenues do it and how the rent is collected whether or not there are things that we can improve on you know a bit of um, cross-referencing and that sort of thing um, yes I mean the housing rents collection team and the revenues collection team are two different teams but they do talk to each other they will liaise um, you know and have have conversations if there's a, a tenant that's um, in difficulties paying their rent likely they're they're in a similar situation with the council tax and so on so um, they, they will um, obviously liaise but it is a, a good point as whether there are further efficiencies that, that can be made going forward Thank you. okay any other questions oh thanks chair uh, yeah just moving quickly down to the uh, failure to meet climate change ambitions and net zero targets and plan for major um, weather impacts. Um, perhaps I'm in a fortunate position that I've recently been doing and working with the environmental agency, which, as we all know, Tamworth is on a floodplain, and mm -hmm. the recent uh, downpours have, have, um, uh, have certainly uh, caused them concern to start to reevaluate the risk assessments in Tamworth. Uh, that work is definitely ongoing, and I know there are further meetings planned within the next quarter um, and the initial findings from some of the projections and plans that they've uh, are, uh, they've shared and I know uh, instead of the risk being a one in a hundred year risk it's now one in a 30 year risk um, so certain areas of the town and their forecast plan of you know where the flooding will happen and how it happens and whatever is a major concern now because I've looked at the uh, the risk matrix here um, and although they're in you know, red and we're likely to turn it around within a few months, I think that this really needs to be re-looked at, readdressed. Uh, I do know that the Chief Exec is meeting with the Environmental Agency in um, October, but I would think that um, I'd like to put it on this committee's work stream to keep a very close eye on that because of the consequences not just to this organisation, but the people of Tamworth uh, is really high. We are now at a limit where they recommend that the flood barrier should be 0.5 of a metre. We're down to 0.3 of a metre. And Storm Henk in, in earlier in the year reduced that down to next to nothing. So there is big areas of Tamworth that could flood. So I think it's prudent that I see that it says you know staff not aware of the action taken and das disasters and whatever I don't want to be too doomy and depressing about it but I think it's now get, coming to the point where this has got to raise um, its, its priority uh, I also think that training education and you know that good old bucket of cash will be needed to sort this out so I'd like to put that on the work stream and certainly elevate it in our priority as an audit and Governance, but are we governing it right? Have we got the right direction? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> Can I add that to that about? I don't know how it affects it, but I mean, our sewerage system is very old in parts of Tamworth, and I think with all the buildings that's going around, the new builds there are the, the potential is that the sewage system can't work and the drainage system can't work and whether or not um, you know what we're doing as an organization to discuss this with partners in order to improve the situation I don't know if this is the right committee but yeah, it's a, a it's a risk you know it is a risk yeah. if we don't get this sorted that as you as you say we'll be under underwater yeah, I'm not sure what committee for that. I think yours own or infrastructure the one it's more perfect suited for that. But yeah, that sounds a good idea to put on that on all. 
Any other questions? Right, any other questions? No. Okay, I do have some. I've been looking at it quite heavily myself, and I'm going to be a bit critical. And sorry about that, in advance. So, on the promoting community, receiving, and cohesion committee, I want to know why it gone down into green from yellow. Because there are two other questions relating to that. But comment complaints it green and are not so white green because I know there are a lot of issues around that area. So I want to know why it green. Why do you feel it should be in the good side when I know there are issues in complaints? And we are bringing member complaints, member inquiry into it in November. The other one is relating to it, it user insight. I'm very happy at it starting to come, but it's all very early. So I'm not so sure at green either. I would say amber. You know, it only started. And any think on that? So in terms of the um green status arrow is that what you're referring yeah. to right so that's to do with the progress against those risk control measures so where work is is ongoing or it's in progress that's why we've got the green arrow there so in terms of the comments compliments and complaints because there has been work done with regard to the policy and annual report which went to cabinet and and the submission to the housing ombudsman as well so that status is classed as green because work is progressing and is on track. Okay, so follow on that. The work is green because it's in progress. Could we have next time a site on how it is at the moment in App City area? Like, it's sort of white and red or green or whatever. I think the main question is why we've gone down from yellow to green on the main six. So our original matrix was in the amber on that one. The current risk has gone down to a green. Um, that should be reflected in, as a result of some of the um, latest risk notes, which gives a, a little bit of an explanation as to where that assessment has come from um, and the, the comment in there is that feedback from local partners is positive towards partnership approach for supporting community cohesion and further proactive work planned in quarter two for the re-establishment of the Tamworth strategic partnership. I mean as we mentioned before with regards to the um, August events at the Holiday Inn, I think this is going to be one of the risks that the scoring will change significantly come the quarter two um, report. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm not looking at it from that point of view. I'm looking at how campaigns are sort of working and the user insights it getting better, but I think it like not matured. On another one, on lack of insight from information and data systems yeah it kind of gone down again i think it should probably be back to where it was there are some good points on here but yeah anyway i think we should move on to debate it anyone want to debate it at all So for Wetman Day, I need to approve, endorse it, but I don't feel comfortable endorsing it myself. I don't know what anyone else thinks. I've moved it. So. You move it. 
do you move between Dorts or not between Dorts? No, Councillor Turner's moved Turner. the recommendations. Yeah, the recommendation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can we have a vote? Two in Dorts? Yeah. It's a yes, no. Yeah. I'll vote against myself. That's carried. That carried. Yeah. So we've got the next one on local government and social care audit and the report. Orderman and the report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of the report this evening is to advise the committee of the contents of the local government and social uh, care ombudsman's annual review letter uh, for the year ending 31st of March 2024. The Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman produces an annual letter setting out statistics about complaints relating to the Council that have been referred to them. The letter was published on the 17th of July 2024 and a copy has been provided at Appendix 1. All decisions made by the Ombudsman regarding complaints against the Council can also be found on the Local Government website with a link to that website also provided. The annual letter statistics focuses on three areas, complaints upheld, compliance with recommendations and satisfactory remedy provided by the authority. You will note from the report that no complaints were investigated during that reporting year. For the reporting period of 23-24, the Ombudsman received six inquiries and complaints about the Council and made six decisions and a breakdown of these have been provided in Appendix 2. Of the six complaints, the Ombudsman closed four of the complaints before contact was made with the Council. The Ombudsman gave the complainant advice to contact the Council to resolve the issue locally or that the complaint was in incomplete or invalid. With respect to the two remaining complaints, the Ombudsman contacted the Council to assess if a full investigation was necessary. Both cases were closed after initial inquiries. In one case, because the Ombudsman judged that the complaint was not warranted by the alleged fault, and the second case was closed as the Ombudsman deemed it was, it was reasonable to take the claim to court. The Council remains committed to continuous improvement and to learning from complaints to improve service delivery and customer satisfaction and to support these following actions are planned for 24-25. The Information Governance Team will continue to facilitate and monitor and improve the complaints process. Reporting on complaints performance will continue to be presented to scrutiny and Cabinet in the quarterly performance reports. Work towards implementation of the Local Government Social Care Ombudsman Complaint Handling Code, which was published in 2024 and will be used with cases are considered going April 26. The link officer Zoe Willicky will continue to attend focus groups and workshops um, and is asked and is asked this evening for committee to endorse the contents of the Ombudsman annual review letter and the summary of the complaints decisions and compliance contained within it. Uh, thank you Chair and I'm happy to take any questions. Is there any questions for that? Okay. Can you just explain what court remedy means? Because I don't. Does that mean he's advised them to go to court? Or? Yes, there's another remedy. Right. Yes, that is correct. There's another remedy that's in place, and that would be the court process. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Anyone want debate? Cool. So for Wetman Dyson. Uh, for committing to the content of 2023 to 2024, Ombudsman and uh, with your letter and the summary of the complaint decision and complaint content were inside it. Any movers? Any second errors? Go. Cool. Can we go to the vote? That gone through. So next part is the wet gate and wet gate and power at two thousand annual update. Okay. Yeah. So what? So we just need to ask the committee if they're happy to endorse it. As okay. If not, we'll need to um, take questions away. Is that committee happy to endorse it? He could put up but not available and couldn't get anyone to come to report. Or we could take questions away. Oh, 
to either endorse it or we can take corrections away because the art is unavailable, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can we get the there. Yeah. Okay. So, pass. Yeah. Now, Monty. Uh, modern slavery segment. This is, this is the same. Same. So, is everyone happy to endorse? Or want questions? I can remember when this was brought forward in 1910, chair by uh, Mrs. Jane Matthews. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've listened to reports of it ever since. Okay, come on, yeah, uh, move her, please. Yeah. Second error. Vote. Go at Pat and then how it be? Um, I think it's just the, the work plan now. Then now it's up the work plan. Okay. So it's just, yeah, I don't need. So either anything or anyone want to add to the work plan? I know Paul Turner won't add it something already. Anything else? Uh, not at this point. No. No. So, uh, just to, to clarify, um, Councillor Tony wants to sort of, yeah, the monitoring of the risk around yeah. the flooding to be added to, to the. So, council. to clarify, you want to look at the risk of flooding? The risk of the flooding. Yeah. And the guidelines around it. Yeah. We're all happy to put that on the work plan. Can I move that on that and the setting there? We don't really. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fine. On happy, it, anyone do come up with any ideas what they want to look into? And they put it on a work plan. Especially, one thing I would like to move forward on it. So, we do random uh, drop, what they call it, randomly looking at different areas of governance and not in the future. To, so we can get explain an idea what's going on in our south. So I'd like to look at that um, schedule of delegation. I know it's coming to full council, but I think you know how, how it's implemented. Um, if we can look at it in a bit more detail. Yeah, um, I think that's a great after, idea. After, after full council or before, whichever the monitoring officer thinks is most appropriate. Like I said, I want anyone to look in any area they like. So we are looking. So just to, to clarify, so the, the sort of the scheme of delegation is in the, the constitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the constitution and the scheme of delegation is brought back to order and governance. I believe it's on the plan for February, I think. Yeah, for February. Um, but there will be communication in terms of a working group as well prior to that. So we can have a look at that. Thank you. Need there any other areas? Oh, you're looking for it. Okay. Give you a bit of time. Okay, were there any others you can think of? I've got member inquiry coming up next month as well. I'm in mean November. I would also like to add campaigns in general into it from the other routes. And it possible. Come on, well. Yeah, that for now. I might come up to something another time.
Oh, also I would like to refer the temp uh, timetable every meeting. It, it, it's a it is. Yeah, it's a okay, that also. Yeah. So, don't in case we want to add more to it. In case we want to add more yeah. to it. Like just that. need to make sure we're within the committee. Yeah. Yet. So, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, what we need to do? Yep, yep. Okay. okay. Thank you, members, for coming, continuing the meeting, and a closer meeting at. Uh, 727.